Well, hello there and welcome along. This is Business Connections Live. It is Business Connections Live number 27. It's great to have your company as always. And uh, welcome along tonight for another cracking show. Now, this week I'm joined by Mike Osborne, Managing Director of Phoenix Business Continuity Unit, an acknowledged leader and award-winning continuity and business continuity disaster recovery service. It's gonna be an interesting evening tonight, actually, because if you're in business at the moment, there's probably people have spoken to you before in the past and they said to you, do you know what, yeah, I think I've got everything backed up. I think I'm pretty much sorted out. I think I know what I'm going to do if, well, if the proverbial should hit the fan. But are you really, really prepared? If something catastrophic happened to your business, building burnt down, loss of data, maybe someone was to come into the market and become additional competition to your business, would your business survive that? I mean, we've had all these floods just recently and there's been a whole host of news about that. But could your business survive a disaster, a natural disaster like that, or a technical disaster? Well, like your business plan that you put away somewhere safely at the end of every day and never look at again after you've been to the bank manager, the whole idea of continuity is really what your business should be looking at. Business continuity. As I said, uh, with me today is Mike Osborne. Mike, thank you very much. You're from Phoenix. I am. Tell us a little bit about Phoenix and just explain a little bit more about what this business continuity really is all about. Phoenix IT Group is a, a UK-based specialist provider. Uh, we provide infrastructure support, break fix maintenance, application support, uh, help desk services for business. Uh, and a big part of, of what we do involves around supporting IT infrastructure. And of course, as business has developed over the last decade, uh, email, um, applications that give 24 by seven availability of data on any device, uh, being able to, to keep those businesses up and running uh, has been a, a growing part of the, the Phoenix business. Do you, do you think people really get the whole concept behind business continuity and this disaster planning? Do they really understand that? Or do you think it's something that people say, do you know what, that's just a little bit too difficult to get my head around. I'm going to put that on the too hard to do shelf. It's absolutely too hard to do. Um, but one of the reasons why I was so keen to get the invite to come on just two weeks ago, I was speaking to someone about business continuity, and I talked about the Business Continuity Institute uh, and the, uh, the business continuity profession. And he said, are you telling me there's actually a profession for business continuity? He said, I had no idea that that existed. Uh, so uh, when you look at a lot of the things that have happened, the recent floods, if you go back a decade, uh, some of the terrorist incidents that are fortunately uh, 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 beyond us in, in recent years, uh, there's a, a whole profession that has kept business in London, particularly the big financial institutions, up and running through all those crises. What do you think the biggest mistake is then for the, the small SMEs or, or, or even medium sized to large businesses? What's the big mistake that they make? Is it that they don't do anything about it at all? Well, coming back to your, does it go on the too hard to do pile? I don't think we help ourselves as an industry. We use uh, acronyms like BIAs, which is business impact uh, uh, analysis and uh, RTOs, which is you know, recovery <laughs> time objectives. Uh, uh, so we can, we can baffle people. Uh, and I think people on the back of that see it as overly complex, uh, potentially expensive. Uh, it might take them a little bit longer than they've got to do uh, to put something comprehensive together and therefore they simply don't do it. What, what would you say is the most common, I would, I would imagine the most common form of disaster recovery that you must do is the IT sector. That must be the bit that people worry about because that's where their lists are, where their customer database is, in, in many cases where their products reside as well. Is that, you know, even accounts as well, is that something that people do first of all? Is that the kind of thing that most people can do? It's a, it's a really good question because disaster recovery perhaps is more understandable than business continuity. Mm -hmm. So disaster recovery is you've had a disaster and you need to recover from it. Right. It doesn't get much more simple than that, <laughs> uh, does it? Um, but IT disaster recovery um, is, is something that I think people do worry about because so many firms now are so reliant on the IT that they use, internet, web-based services. You know, we've seen this year another record set of Christmas sales over the web rather than physical sales by people walking into, into shops and so on. So there's been really a, a rapid um, 
change from old-fashioned ways of doing business to moving on to electronic ways of doing business. And therefore the ability to go back to, let's say, a paper transaction, filling in an order form, going into a shop to sort out your, your problem. Well, the fact you have an audit trail. A, a, absolutely. Um, a, a lot of that has disappeared because everything is filling forms in online and you know, here's your order track and click on this to see whether the postman's delivered it or, or not. So the IT part of disaster recovery often now takes over uh, perhaps looking at a more holistic approach as to what buildings do I use, what people do I employ, what important roles do they have and how does that all blend together with the IT part to give me an overall plan uh, that would cover not only IT disaster recovery but general impact to the business. Do you think it's, as we get into the program more, do you think we're going to be able to break down the, the, the core sections of how we should approach this and get a resolution to the whole issue? I, I think that's a really important outcome from the program because if we can demystify business continuity and explain really quite how simple it is uh, by taking that sort of siloed approach to looking at each of those components then I think the people watching tonight will get some real value. All right then, so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, Mike Osborne, Managing Director of Phoenix uh, Business is with me. We're talking about business continuity and also making certain that you're ready for disaster when it does happen. That's what tonight is all about. Uh, before we continue talking to Mike, what we are going to do is we're going to look back at some of the things that we were doing last week. Now, of course, we had a rerun of our LinkedIn program uh, that was up. In fact, thank you very much indeed for all the people that have watched it. Over a thousand views of that on YouTube. And if you do watch it on YouTube or this program for that matter please do subscribe to the channel in fact if you want to subscribe on this particular video just up there you should see there's a subscribe button so if you just click on that you should be able to subscribe straight to the channel now uh, the other thing that we did last week we also went out to the big aviation debate uh, it probably hasn't escaped anybody's attention but at the moment there's a big debate going on where they should build the next runway or the next airport for that matter uh, at the big aviation deb debate put on by the Surrey Chamber of Commerce uh, we actually went along we had Heathrow the CEO of Heathrow Airport there uh, we also had the CEO of Gatwick Airport and a representative from the mayor's office as well talking about their Isle of Grain project fascinating if you want to watch the entire debate the whole thing is on it's a special it's on our website at www.businessconnectionslive.com. Uh, the whole debate is there, including some of the questions. Uh, there it is, just sitting on the screen in front of me right now. So that's www.businessconnectionslive.com. You can watch the entire debate there. But just to give you a little flavour of some of the people that we met on the day, here's a little bit of a taste of what happened at the big aviation debate last week. I'm Adam Marshall, I'm Executive Director for Policy at the British Chambers of Commerce, which is the national body for Chambers of Commerce across the UK, and I had the privilege of uh, comparing today's event uh, with great debate on the future of aviation here in the South East. How successful do you think today has been? Uh, today's been an incredibly successful event because what it's allowed local businesses to do is to come in and evaluate the proposals for new airport expansion uh, on their merits and to hear directly from the airports and the promoters themselves about the kinds of schemes they want to deliver. So what I'm hoping is that those businesses can then go away and take the knowledge that they've garnered uh, and decide who they're going to support and how they're going to do it. Well, yes, that's right. I mean, the Airports Commission uh, announced its uh, interim report before Christmas and it shortlisted uh, three options uh, for expansion to deliver that extra runway that we need in the UK. Two were for a third runway at Heathrow. Uh, the second was for a second runway at Gatwick. And what the Commission also said was that it found sufficient merit in the Isle of Grain proposal for a, uh, for a new four-runway hub airport. Uh, it's therefore going to uh, analyse in greater detail between now and the middle of this year that proposal and decide in September whether or not to shortlist the Isle of Grain along with uh, expansion plans for Gatwick and Heathrow. Well, I'm certainly in favour of Gatwick. I think if I look at the other two proposals, uh, there's only one of the two currently on the shortlist, which is Heathrow. So from our perspective, we really see this as a two-horse race now and a competition to decide where the next runway goes between Gatwick and Heathrow. 
Uh, I have a saying which is that while Britain dithers, others do. Uh, we've spent far too many decades in this country agonising over whether we should expand our aviation capacity, uh, whether we need new airports or new runways, etc. We've got to get on and do something. The business community is impatient and it won't tolerate simply more warm words and more kicking of the can down the road. They want to see a solution, they want to see something actually happening on the ground. One of the reasons why the Mayor is so attracted to a new airport to the east of London is the regeneration effects it would have. It would transform East London but also North Kent as well in terms of jobs and houses and a boost for the economy out there. I think one of the biggest things that's happened to Gatwick over the last few years is the fact that the BAA monopoly was broken up and Gatwick was sold. That's when I joined the business and in separate ownership, I think in four short years since 2009, we've made dramatic progress, improving customer service, growing passenger volumes and bringing in lots of long-haul airlines as well as short-haul airlines and investing over a billion pounds in upgrading the facilities that passengers enjoy. People say it can't be done, it's too expensive and it takes too long, but actually we think that's just a council of despair. And of course, countries the world over have built new runways and new airports uh, while we've become the kind of the world champions of dither and delay. So let's just get on and do it now. Well, the Gatwick option can deliver nationally and the Gatwick option can deliver legacy carriers, uh, getting you to the long haul destinations, particularly in the emerging economies. And in four short years, we've had dramatic success. We now serve over 50% of the high growth emerging economies, whilst at the same time, we can get business travellers to and from all of the European major cities and business destinations with affordable travel on the low cost uh, airlines. I think everyone argues some of their points well and everyone has their, their, their weak points. Heathrow has a difficulty with the fact that it's located in a densely populated area. Gatwick has a difficulty because it can't attract some of the same flights that Heathrow would. And of course the Mayor's proposal has difficulty because it doesn't exist yet except on the drawing board. So all of these proposals have difficulties, all of them have their advantages. The important thing is to actually get down and do something. Let's see some diggers on the ground. It was a fascinating debate, in fact, absolutely fascinating. And for the money, I would say that the CEO of Gatwick, perhaps just by a nose, uh, put over the most compelling case. But as we said last week on the programme, the fact that we've got Heathrow and we've got Gatwick sitting side by side, maybe a super hub airport is what we're talking about. Unfortunately, of course, the two airports are not owned by the same people, so they've got different priorities when it comes to business for the two companies. But a fascinating day. If you do want to watch the whole thing, if you go to the website, you'll find it there, www.businessconnectionslive.com. Go for the, the great aviation debate, and you can see it there. And the entire event is actually sitting online you can watch the entire thing there's Colin Matthews CEO of Heathrow Airport uh, it was a truly interesting afternoon if you've got any interest at all and I suppose to a certain extent we do try to say that this isn't about being a concentric southeast program this is nationwide and and what happens with our major airports in the southeast let's face it will affect businesses both in the south and in the north up and down the country you it will have a direct effect on your business all right then let's uh, move on with what we're talking about tonight mike osborne he's the managing director of phoenix business uh, good business continuity unit an acknowledged leader and award winner uh, providing business continuity and disaster recovery services if you've never ever thought about it maybe tonight is the opportunity to start thinking about it it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? And that is the problem with it. It's, it's difficult to say out loud, isn't it? And I suppose when you abbreviate it as well, it doesn't really mean anything. And in fact, sometimes the words themselves don't mean anything, do they? Not to the uninitiated. And I think that's what we want to try and achieve for tonight, isn't it? To, to, to demystify some of the complexity of it all. Is it very much a case that you get the security salesman coming around and he, he bangs on your back door and he says, Oh, a thief can get in there, whoo, get through those windows. And, and to a certain extent, we all leave it until we've had the break and then we come back and then the horse has truly bolted. Is that something that you find in your industry, that the people who are your prime customers are the ones it's already affected? Uh, I think historically, going back in time, uh, there was the fear, uncertainty and doubt sales approach. And people have said, oh, well, you know, lots of flooding that have happened, Mike. You must be inundated with inquiries. And what actually happens is people have a bit of a mooch around, uh, you know, do a bit of window shopping, ask a few questions, and then get on with their day-to-day -day business life. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is, is one of the biggest drivers right now to people looking at business continuity is satisfying customer concern. 
because if you think about it, what 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 your major clients would be interested in is if they're putting business your way and then they're embedding, embedding whatever you do into what they do right. and they've got this big brand and reputation and large customer base to satisfy, if you fail, they fail. So what, what big firms are doing now, the firms that have got all the experts in business continuity and have done disaster recovery for years are starting to say, well, we know that we're okay but what about our suppliers? So is this putting an undue amount of money uh, uh, on these smaller organisations? And does it maybe price some of the smaller SMEs out of the business because now they've actually got to be thinking about that as well? I don't think price is the issue because I think what you and I will talk about over the next uh, half an hour or so will be about the simplicity of being able to make lots of, of strides towards having a plan without that cost you, costing you an awful uh, lot of money. And I'll just give you an example on price and we'll come back to it mm -hmm. later. We, we look after about a thousand what you and I would call small medium enterprises. Most of those are paying less than a thousand pounds a month to have a really quite comprehensive plan uh, that would include work area and IT disaster recovery and the building of a plan. Now, obviously, for really... Now, let's just have a bit of a scale. So, for, for people that are watching this, what, sure. we're, we're talking about an SME, but what, what number of people, on average, would be working for them? Well, anywhere from, um, in, in, in uh, a single office, anywhere from 50, maybe, to 150. Um, so, not really micro firms, and we can talk about what very small mm -hmm. firms can do as well, but really you know, modest... 50 million or less type firms, that's what it would cost. And I suppose, you know, if you're looking at it like that, £12,000 over the course of a year is probably the managing director's expenses tab. Well, I couldn't comment on managing director's <laughs> expenses, of course. Um, but what it does say is in real terms, it's less than, you know, half a, a headcount. Uh, and what we're finding is that firms who are proactive about putting a plan in place are, are using it to create a competitive advantage rather than feeling browbeaten into having to do something. So what do they do then when they come to you? So let's, let's look at the mechanics of it. They come to you. Do, do you then talk to them and say, well, actually, what you need is this, this and this? Or is there a package that they buy that is already preset and, you know, take that away and it'll do everything you need it to do? Is, is it a custom job or, or is it, you know, or is it something that you just buy off the shelf? Every company has a little bit of individuality that you need to be mindful of. Um, but the, the common um, misconception when people look at business continuity and disaster recovery is trying to think through all the individual things that could happen. So I'm going to have a flood. Uh, I might have a, uh, a fire. Uh, there's going to be Legionella in the air conditioning system. Uh, and you can sit there and spend a lot of time writing down all these potential threats. And in those three examples that I've given you, the impact is the same. The impact is you can't use the building because it's flooded, it's burnt down, or health and safety won't let you in. So what you need to think of is, if I lost my building, what would the impact be? And therefore, what do I need to plan for? And instead of having three plans, a fire plan, a flood plan, and a Legionella plan, you have one, which is, I've lost my office, what am I going to do? Is that the most difficult part then of actually convincing somebody that they do need to do this, the, the actual understanding of what they're trying to achieve by doing it? I think most firms would say, I understand why I need to do it, I just think it's too difficult and too expensive, and that's why I haven't done it yet. And let me just explain why I feel that way. We're all consumers, aren't we? You, you and I, we're, we're consumers. When we phone uh, for a service and it rings out and rings out and rings out and no one answers, we're, we're a bit frustrated. Mm -hmm. We think that's poor service. Um, if we ring again and it still isn't answered... We go elsewhere. At what point do we go elsewhere? Uh, and therefore... With, with this sort of always-on economy and with so many choices to make for the same types of services, if you're not available for your customers, they will very quickly go elsewhere. And once they've gone elsewhere, you've lost them. So how do you convince your customers, the people who are actually looking at doing this disaster recovery or business continuity, how do you convince them then that this is the right course of action? Is it by giving examples like that? Is it by explaining the consequences to their business or, or are there other ways that you, that you actually go about doing it? 
It's, it's as ever, it's a combination of things, but when you explain that there are business benefits to this, that you can grow an organisation on the back of having this, rather than it being yet another cost of doing business, they very quickly get it. When you then move on to the fact that it's not as expensive as they thought in the first place, you've broken down another hurdle. And when you can work with people just on the basics, like those examples I gave earlier, it's not about the, the potential uh, cause, it's what's the impact. You, you break down the fact that it's not an unnecessary cost, it's actually going to help them and it's not that expensive anyway. Uh, so that, that combination, I think, very quickly sinks in and, and you can have then a, a very healthy conversation rather than one that's a resistant conversation based on fear, uncertainty and doubt. Let's talk a little bit about the clarity of all this because you've mentioned natural disasters there. I mentioned IT disasters, which, and I think prior to the programme going, going on air, we, we kind of said that, that IT, to a certain extent, is the kind of thing that everybody does. Mind you on saying that, how often have you looked inside of a... Man, a manual from a software provider who says, and don't forget, use your backup if anything goes wrong. You remember the backup, yeah. it's the thing that you put in the yeah. safe. Yeah. And of course, we've all been there, something catastrophic has happened, and we've lost that backup, or we haven't got the backup to recover from. Yeah. So is it, is it then, you've got natural disasters, we've got sort of technology disasters, and are there other, are there other types? people disasters and market disasters I would imagine. Well we can, uh, you're absolutely right and uh, this week is business continuity awareness week. So right at the start I mentioned that uh, people hadn't appreciated there was a business continuity profession and this week they've just done a, a horizon scanning of threats. I've got, the, I've got the document here and in terms of the top 10 threats to, to business they say unplanned IT and telecom outages is number one, Right. cyber attack is number two and data breach is number three. Well when I think of disasters I'd have said fire, flood, uh, terrorism, I don't think I'd have said IT, cyber attack and data breach. So but that just shows you how far technology has moved on in the, in the potential threat to business. I think the thing that's interesting as well, and we hear more and more about the, cy the cyber threats that we're, we're talking about at the moment, aren't we? And of course they're coming from, from countries outside of Europe, we're talking about, mate, dare I say it, China and, and countries like that. Do, do you see that as, as a major contributor? I mean, they do. Do you see that as well in what you're doing? We do. I think that the, the difference between what you would call traditional disasters is they're very binary. You know you're in one yeah. or you're not. Um, and you know when you're coming out of it as well, don't you? Absolutely. The, the thing about cybercrime is the things that we see uh, reported in the press are quite often because the hackers that have permeated the, the cyber crime have done it for some form of promotion. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is, is the real cyber crime is going on when people don't even know it's going on. So that has made people really change their mindset within the, the profession from recovery more towards resiliency. So you're resilient from cyber attack, data loss, data breaches. So are you involved in that as well? Because it just all of a sudden it seems to be a very <laughs> diverse range of things that the organizations like yours and other companies are actually doing. They're doing everything from, as we said, natural disasters. Now we're talking about cyber attacks. And you know the next thing we're going to talk about is going to be you know, the way the market is changing around them and all these things having consequences back onto their business. Wh where does your expertise come from? Well, naturally, we evolve with the marketplace. Uh, I talked about Phoenix uh, IT Group at the start, so naturally we're a, an IT infrastru infrastructure support company. It's easy for you to say. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Touché. <laughs> So we, uh, we come from an IT uh, background, so the things like cyber threat, cyber security, data breaches, it's in our DNA. Uh, what we've developed over the last 10-15 years is the property side of things, so standby buildings and office recovery, data centres, etc. Um, but coming back to, to, to your question, um, what we need to be really careful of is that we don't overcomplicate uh, the discussion because we can do very simple traditional disaster recovery. We can do very complicated IT cyber attack type services. Um, but we can take organizations in the steps along that curve depending on where they are in the process. Are they just starting or are they quite mature but they're recognizing there's through new threats to the business? All right, well, well let's, let's look at the 
one of the, the topics you brought up and something that I do know that you said is it's actually proven to be very popular. We'll, we'll stick on the whole world of IT because I think a lot of people can get their head around that bit. However, we've all been through the floods. We are just miles away from where the Chertsey sausage was, the legendary Chertsey sausage. But it's, it's a fan, the sausage is a lot of fun. Uh, but, you know, let's look at the IT. We're here in a building here and, and we're producing... Um, broadcast quality video that's going out. We're sending, we're streaming it out live, but our masters that are here are all high definition masters. So we are collecting on an hourly basis huge amount of data. So how do we back that up? How do we make certain that we are protected in case our studio was to burn down or, or whatever? How do we go about protecting ourselves? The first step is you back it up, uh, yeah. and you'd be amazed at how many people either don't back it up or they don't check that their backup has actually worked. Um, so there's a, there's a nuance there. Do a backup, but also check. The second mistake is having done the backup, the backup sits on top of the server, or it sits in the desk in the building that if it's burnt down... It goes too. It goes too. So the biggest lesson, and it's dead easy and dead cheap, is to pick up the tape and take it off-site or pick up the tapes and take it, or pick up the standby disk drive and take it off-site, and do that every night. If you can't do it every night, do it at least once a week, and make sure that you keep a copy off-site. A lot of people are probably watching this are feeling very smug with themselves and very, feeling very comfortable because perhaps maybe they're using the cloud at the moment, they're, they're pushing everything up into the cloud. Sure. But organisations like ours and other organisations that have got large databases, large accounting databases or whatever, the amount of data sometimes just is too much to be doing it that way. Are there solutions then to resolve that? Absolutely. It's a great question because following on from the description of tape, what people might be thinking, well, Mike, that's, that, that's a great idea, but I've now got 32 tapes mm -hmm. worth of data and I simply don't have time to do that backup every night and I certainly can't carry a briefcase of tapes home with me. So um, one of the biggest applications of the cloud in terms of technology use is to be able to backup into the cloud. If you've got an iPhone, you'll see there's iCloud on, on, on the Apple device, for example. So we do that for businesses. So to prevent the overhead of tape, to prevent the have I taken it home or not, to prevent the question as to whether or not the backup has worked, what we can do is we can put some equipment on site, that will back it up locally, it will compress it, it will encrypt it to make sure it's secure, and then we will store it in our very safe uh, data vaults so that if people need a file they can recall it very quickly. If they've had a, a complete disaster we've got their full set of data including sort of incrementals going back for a, a number of, of versions in case they overwrote something. So now, that's, that's when, a service that we provide. Now when you talk to people like, shall we say, Microsoft who yes. have got Microsoft 365, what they're saying to you is, that, well you feel very confident with Microsoft because yes. everything that you're doing there is in the cloud. Apple, the iCloud, they're doing exactly the same thing. Your, your data has been whisked away Way. But what about the reliability of cloud services and also your servers and your services? Is there a downside to it? I mean, for instance, are Microsoft as good as we think they are? Are your services a premier brand? Are they better? What are the differences that we should consider when we're looking at that? So if we start off with the, uh, the question about the cloud and services, um, if you look at the top 10 outages over the last 12 months, there's some big brand names there mm -hmm. that, have, that have suffered outages. So Microsoft and Google uh, are part of the top 10 outages. Now, they might, might not have lasted very long at all, but they were outages. And that's not because they're poor companies, but actually cloud services and applications in the cloud, it's a very modern service. It's only a few years old. It hasn't got decades and decades of all the lessons that you learn when you're building these new technologies. So it, it's just one of the small downsides of the advent of, of, of cloud. I think what people do need to understand though is because cloud is so easy and relatively cheap to get yourself hooked into, small medium companies that have, have done that do it because it is easy and mm -hmm. cheap. They don't often stop to consider what would happen if nothing's available. So if you have invoicing in the cloud, if you have your uh, customer database in the cloud, if you have your email in the cloud, and if you have your uh, Word, uh, uh, Microsoft Office, or Google Apps in the cloud, your business becomes hooked on the cloud, cloud services. Yeah. And if the cloud goes offline, for whatever reason, either the supplier or communications failure, uh, then you are you are you know completely um, 
without a service there is no alternative so people need to understand the risk making a very choice. good case for actually keeping everything in sight and then backing it off site. i mean it, it's quite interesting when you hear it like that that you know maybe the cloud's a good place to be but say you you cease to have communications with the cloud then you're really up a gum tree aren't you well it, it just goes to show that um don't put all your eggs in in that particular basket um, just going on, on, on to that subject though of the cloud, I think people, because of the brand names, assume that it will always be on, it will always be available, and that of course they will be backing up your data. Uh, there was a, a recent communication uh, from uh, the financial regulator in London that went out to, to the big firms that said, don't forget that if you outsource some of these services, you're not outsourcing the risk. If we want to know that you've got your data and your data backed up and it's secure, we're going to come and talk to you. You're not going to be able to tell us that it's the supplier's fault. You cannot outsource your risk management and business continuity. What differentiates then your servers over theirs? Well, first of all, we're, we're a specialist. So um, we put together services that are designed to be not only resilient, but to be disaster tolerant as well. So what do I mean by that? Um, going back to your earlier uh, example of, of you as a business here, uh, you are backing things up, that's good. We talked earlier, yeah. you are taking some stuff off site, yeah. that's, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 that's good. So what we do is we build very resilient data centers and servers, so we've got that failover in case uh, an air conditioning unit fails, power supply goes off, a server fails. We build tolerance uh, when we build these centres. And what we then do is do it all again, somewhere else. I suppose people don't really uh, appreciate, do they, that if you've got a thing that's got a motor in it that's spinning with a microprocessor, that could actually fall over. And you could end up having a very nice doorstop. And if you if you are backing it up onto that in the cloud, and there's another one somewhere else, then at least there's there's backup to the backup, isn't there? And that that's what that's what we uh, that's what we we do. Uh, I mentioned earlier um, uh, standby offices, so we actually build corporate headquarters of yeah, our biggest ones, two thousand uh, positions. No one works there. Uh, it is as if you were going home on a Friday night uh, and, you're, the place you're, is empty. and you're, you're just looking around to, to make sure that you're not going to switch the lights off and look anybody in. PCs on desks, fax machines, phones on desks, photocopiers, bins in the corner. We build them and they are on standby for potential uh, disasters. And, and, and on a serious note, I suppose, if we look back... This is exactly what must have happened after 9-11, mustn't it? I mean, we, we uh, catastrophic. Um, problem there for, for business and for people, unfortunately. But I mean, it was it was a shocking incident. To do. And I do know that there are particular data centres around London that do sit just like that, don't they? Uh, absolutely, and we and we have we have some of those. But it, you, you mentioned 9/11. Of course, that was America's big terrorist incident, and one that really shook the foundations of business continuity and disaster recovery across the globe. But before then, we'd had St Mary Axe with the IRA bombing campaign yes. uh, in London. We had Bishopsgate. We had the Warrington uh, uh, bomb. Um, so, so there's always the potential for something like that to happen, regardless of where you are. Uh, th 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 there is. Uh, and it's interesting, on, on, the, uh, on the list, the top ten uh, list that I talked about earlier, active terrorism is, is nine. So thankfully, we have sort of moved on from that, rather. But what, what all those things did is where people were looking at IT disaster recovery that we've talked so much around, they started to say, well, if I've got my IT and I've got my data in this bunker somewhere, is it any good to me if my users can't sit at a desk and pick up the phone and talk to customers and interact as, as, a, as a team of people? And therefore, business continuity was born, and that's distinct from disaster recovery, because, of course, IT disaster recovery does He's what it says on the, tin, on the tin. If you're then looking at where your people can work, the telephony, the comms, access to the web, access, uh, access to, to applications, where does your post get redirected uh, to, those sort of things that are all the practicalities of keeping a business running rather than an IT system start to come into focus. And well, let's talk a little bit more about about the, that side of things. We've talked. I think we've talked about IT. We're, we've kind of, you know, we should all be doing a backup. There's no two ways about it. You should be doing a backup. And and what do you do actually with with that data that you've got? As I said, you know, we we produce 
gigabyte terabits of data on a regular basis what do we do with it how do you make certain if this building was to burn down and we didn't have uh, those particular files off-site would the business just cease to exist I mean that is the business I suppose it is your content it is your data and if your business is like that is that what you're doing are you backing it up and are you taking it home or are you putting it in a fireproof safe those are the kind of things you've really got to consider or do you need an organization like phoenix to be absolutely there i love the whole idea of phoenix as well you know rising from the ashes you know a brand new company and and and, you know, and isn't that what this is all about it's the awareness and thinking about it we don't want it ever to happen but if it does are you prepared all right, we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about, I mean, I love the whole idea about there are empty offices like ghost towns sitting there waiting uh, for a disaster to happen and then people to, to all merge on it and then actually run their businesses from it. We'll talk more about how you go about setting that kind of thing up and why it's important to you as a small to medium scale enterprise to be thinking about that kind of uh, recovery after a disaster. I'll tell you what we'll do right now, though. We're going to have a look at what's been happening over the last seven days. Of course, today's been a busy old day. Uh, the the old chancellor he's been standing up there at the box and uh, he's been giving some well depending where you are good news bad news it was interesting to hear the reply uh, from labor the day so with an update what's been happening in the news over the past seven days here's another present This is Business Connections Live with the business news for the 19th of March 2014. George Osborne delivered his fifth budget this afternoon. Export finance lending interest rate is to be cut by a third and lending double to three billion. September's fuel duty rise will not now be brought in later on this year. Personal tax allowances rise to £10,500 next year, giving an average saving of £800. The 40p tax rate threshold is to rise from £41,450 to £41,865 from next month and then up by a further 1% to £42,285 next year. The Independent Office of Budget Responsibility growth forecast has been revised upwards to 2.7% up from 2.4% in the autumn statement. Growth next year is also revised up to 2.3%, then 2.6% in 2016 and 2017, with growth expected to return to long-term trend of 2.5% in 2018. One and a half million new jobs have been forecast to grow in the next five years. And high street stores will get £1,000 off of their rates and businesses the £2,000 employment allowance. From next year, corporation tax is to drop from 21% to 20% and under 21s will be taken out of the jobs tax. Business rates, discounts and enhanced capital allowances will be extended for another three years. And in other news today, the unemployment figures for three months to January have dropped by 63,000 to 2.33 million. The Office for National Statistics added that the number of people claiming job seekers allowance last month fell by 34,600 to 1.17 million. Meanwhile, the ONS said average earnings increased by 1.4% in the year to January, up 0.2% on the previous month. The latest official data gives the government a budget boost with a record number of people in work. More than 459,000 are employed compared to a year ago, taking the total to just over 30 million in jobs. It's the highest figure since records were started in 1971. And in technical news, Google Chromecast is now on sale in the UK. Chromecast is a direct rival to Apple's £99 TV product, which lets users stream online content, including shows from YouTube, Netflix and the BBC's iPlayer from their iPhone, iPad or iPod to their TV. Google's version resembles a large USB flash drive but with an HDMI connector. It has no remote, instead relying solely on a smartphone, tablet or computer for control. Chromecast is available now to buy in the UK for £30. 
And if you have comments or views on these or any other stories in the news, please contact us on all social media or email studio at businessconnectionslive.com. Interesting, actually. I got myself one of those Chromecasts just a couple of weeks back. It's fantastic. It really is. You're sitting there, iPhone on the telly, laptop on the telly. Great, great idea. And I understand as well that another company has also brought something very similar out as well. Seems to be there's a whole number of these. If you've been using um, AirPlay from Apple, it's very similar to that. But the fact that you can do it from your, from an Android phone, from your iPhone, from your, your desktop, from anything, from your pad, now you can actually watch a whole load of content, uh, films as well, things like Netflix, you can actually just uh, now uh, bound over there. Sounds like an advert there all of a sudden. I am really impressed. And in fact, you could actually watch this program if you wanted to using a Chromecast on your big tally. I'd be this big. Be amazing, wouldn't it? Uh, you're watching Business Connections Live. My guest this evening is Mike Osborne. He's the Managing Director of Phoenix Business Continuity Unit and acknowledged leader and award-winning providers of business continuity and disaster recovery services. It sounds serious because it is serious. Now, we've talked about the IT, and I would imagine a lot of us have looked into the IT and we've, we think we've got maybe some form of a system all set up there at the moment but quite frankly maybe it's not as robust as you think it is and maybe you should just stand back for a moment and uh, maybe reconsider what your IT backup and your plans are. We were talking a moment or so ago about buildings. At what point does somebody turn around and go that's that's what I need to do? Is, is, when do they say yes it's going to be buildings when 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 do they start doing that probably now after the floods but when do companies stand back and at what point what are the triggers to make them do that we get two types of customers so you get a customer who has recognized the it requirement and and maybe has put a contract in place for that uh, and they start to mature in their thinking around business continuity and start to look at buildings and people and telephones and internet connections and uh, and those wider uh, wider requirements uh, so that's one type you get a new type and as you said maybe driven by the floods that come out to market and say well yeah IT was part of my problem but my big problem was I couldn't get to my building or my building mm -hmm. was was flooded and therefore the IT is just a part uh, so people diving into business continuity right now, if you'll excuse the pun, yes. uh, are looking at... I, I just ignored it when you say that, yes. <laughs> uh, and I thought I was funny. Um, uh, uh, are looking at the total solution, not just IT disaster recovery. One's a maturity journey and the other one is a, you know, coming into it, uh, having had something like that happen to them. Do you, do you think there's any size business that, that really looking at this, is, they shouldn't be doing or they should be doing? We, we've talked about the, the, the medium-sized SMEs that are out there, the, the 50 to maybe 500. You know, the, the, for a lot of people, they're, they're a lot bigger. What about the, the smaller guys, the, the two, three, four, ten-man outfit that's out there, they're, they're sort of working very hard. Should they be considering this as well? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's an irony in this, in that the really big firms, the big banks, the big uh, uh, high street brands that everyone would know and, and trust, um, they are highly resilient. They can withstand knocks to their IT and they've got spare buildings because they've got multiple call centres. If they suffer an incident, they're probably more interested in their reputation and their share price damage than actually losing their technology or not being able to deliver a service. The smaller you get, the bigger the actual impact of having a disaster because you're not resilient. You haven't got a second uh, uh, office. Um, so for the really small firms, uh, it is a topic that they need to look at, um, but it's really quite simple. If you've got customer names, customer contact details, make sure you've got those outside of a single office. Make sure you've, you, you've got a copy of them uh, uh, somewhere. If you've got a single telephone line coming in, work with your comms provider to see how quickly it can be diverted, even to a mobile number, if your telephone line goes down. So there's two tips there that actually the most important things that small businesses need is to be contactable by a customer or to be able to contact a customer. Also, when we're looking at larger businesses, as they have the ebb and flow maybe of their customer base as it changes, a lot of small businesses actually are, are dependent on maybe a smaller number of customers. Now, I, I've read 
the, what you're also looking at as well is reputation protection as well, and also the changes in the market. I mean, it does seem that to a certain extent you're all things to all men. I mean, how do you go about when it comes to reputation management or when it comes to, you know, the, the changes in, in what's, what's happening in the market? A competitor coming on stream who you weren't prepared for. Is it advice that you give? I mean, how, how can you help businesses there? Well, what, what you're sort of blurring into is, is business uh, resilience, uh, business advice. And obviously business resilience is a huge topic around you know, where you might base your offices, uh, um, uh, how you might look at your staff uh, uh, and look at succession plans and so on and and that that side of it is something we can talk about but we wouldn't claim to be uh, claim to be experts on that but of course managing reputation and in particular managing how you communicate in a crisis is certainly one of the things that is a byproduct of, of what we do uh, and you, you had a, a feature on earlier about aviation and of course this last seven days the Malaysian uh, uh, airliner going missing um, is, is a dreadful story uh, compounded by how poorly Malaysian Airlines have been perceived to be managing crisis communications. So sometimes it's not only have you got a disaster plan, it's how you communicate and how you communicate effectively during that crisis and that's all part of an overall business continuity and crisis management plan. It's, it's interesting you say that because we look back at the floods and what one of the criticisms towards the Environment Agency of course was the fact that they didn't communicate what they were doing. I mean they were between a rock and a hard place all of a sudden this happened and they were in a very difficult situation. However there were times when they just didn't communicate the solutions or at least what they were doing very clearly and you know I suppose that's a case that, really an example there where with a little bit of planning a little bit of forethought a little bit of forethought they would have been in a better place I, i'm not putting you on the spot to give a comment on the environment agency but you can just see that if that's happening with them who is a large government agency that must be happening with businesses up and down the country it is and a, a really good example of that is uh, if you remember just a month or so ago there was an ATM outage for uh, Lloyds Bank yes, indeed, customers yeah. um, that affected about 25% of their customers for three to four hours on a Sunday. I woke up on Monday morning, every newspaper I opened had got a story on, on the outage, every radio program and TV news program led on the story. Yeah. That was three or four hours for 25% of Lloyd's customers and yet they were pilloried in the press as a consequence. Ah, they're a bank. And they deserve it. <laughs> My point is is that we look after 1,600 customers. They have contracts with us to support right. them in, in, in incidents. Um, being able to recover from quite a catastrophic incident in three hours would be in the top 5% of our customers. So actually they did they, they actually probably did very well didn't they? They did incredibly well from a recovery time uh, uh, perspective but it just shows the intolerance now of us as consumers to any form of outage now if they would be at the top five percent of my customer base and I only have 1,600 customers that have got contracts how many SMEs are out there that don't have a contract at all at all at all I tell you what, here's, I mean, are you one of those customers? Are you one of those potential customers? But this program is never meant to be a sell if it just makes you reconsider your position in business on how you do manage this, and then we've, we've done our job. But obviously there are going to be contact details on this particular page if you do want to contact uh, Mike here and find out more, or his business and find out more about what they can do for you as a small to medium scale SME. Just to give you a bit of an insight, if you go onto their website, you will find uh, this short video, which kind of really explains, it really explains everything that there is to know when it comes to what Phoenix are all about. There's, the, there's their website, here's the little video that we're going to be talking about right now. I'll tell you what, let's watch that video and it'll give you a real insight into what Phoenix is all about. We live in hazardous times. Every second of every day, somewhere in the world, things are happening. Devastating things. Events that might have consequences that no one can foresee. Natural disasters. And man-made ones. Events that can harm people. 
and businesses. We may not be able to stop them happening, but we can be prepared. When an incident disrupts your business, the clock is ticking. There's no time for hesitation, wondering what you can do, how to respond. It's time for action, decisive action. For companies with business continuity plans, it's time to put them into practice. The scope of the risk is anything from uh, reputational loss that can be overcome over time, right the way through to a complete collapse uh, of a business. Now, one of the key messages about business continuity is around convincing your customers that you can continue to deliver that service under any circumstance. But it goes further than that. It says to your staff that you care enough about their own well-being and livelihoods that you've thought through your ability to be able to recover. And uh, importantly, during a recession, it also says to your owners, your financial backers, that you can also withstand an incident and therefore their ability to fund you shouldn't be undermined as a result of their concerns uh, should you suffer a disaster. Business continuity management is vital because failure to develop capability could have a devastating impact on the organisation. But success in taking BCM into the boardroom and risk decision making can actually build a more resilient, more agile business. It's very interesting. You look at that and you actually see what they're talking about there. And you can see here we've got riots that are taking place. And of course, we had the riots in London, um, what, 18 months ago or thereabouts. This is an interesting um, uh, statistic. 25% never reopen after a natural disaster. 80% likely to go out of business. 75% fail within three years. I mean, statistics like that are absolutely terrifying when it comes to talking about recovery from a disaster, isn't it? Well, you, you talked earlier about, you know, um, is it a business benefit or not? Uh, and there you go, there's some statistics that say it has to be a business benefit, but you just have to be bothered enough uh, to do something about it. When you look at all the research and statistics, you know, there's still about 60% of people that respond to these surveys about business continuity that says, I've never di had a disaster and I'm never going to have a disaster, so you know, I'm, I'm not going to do uh, anything about it until, of course, the day that you, you have a disaster and you regret that decision. If you had a checklist to do, because we're getting, we're getting very close to the end of the programme, actually, but if you had a checklist to do for, and, and a, a matrix can be different for the two different types of business that we're going to talk about, but for a small SM, SME, what would be the checklist that you would go through with them? Well, people will be incredibly supportive and patient with you if you've had a disaster. Um, what frustrates people is if they don't know what's going on. Because if you're a consumer, you've probably ordered something or want to order something. And that's important to you. You want to know, are you still going to get the service? Is that good that they've ordered online going to be delivered in the time frame uh, that they've asked for it to, to, to be done? So my golden rule, the simple rule, is communicate. Make sure that you, if you've got a website, uh, that you can recover that website or redirect it quickly. Uh, if you've got telephones, make sure you can redirect those quickly. If you've got customer lists and order dockets, make sure you've got a copy of those off-site. Because if you have an incident and you can't manufacture or you can't ship things out uh, or you can't do whatever service that you're doing, as long as you tell people, it will buy you time to fix the other stuff. And, and that's important, uh, important advice for the small business. Yes. What about the, the business that's slightly larger than that? So we were talking earlier on, you know, the 50 to 100 to 500 employees. What should they be considering? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to save people lots of money with what I'm about to say now. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Because Pitching. most people think they've got to recover everything. And the reality is you don't. Now, if you look at people, an office full of um, 100 people. Well, I've got to recover 100 people. You don't. Not in the first week. You don't. What do you need then? Well, if you look across all our customers, about 25% of staff in an office is all you need in the first week of a crisis. So people who look and say, well, 100 people, that's huge, loads of, of space, loads of tech that I need, as long as you've got 25 people, they can answer those phones, they can start the applications and business, getting back on its feet, and then once you've bought yourself that bit of time, you can start to bring the other people into play. So that's about £5,000 worth of consultancy just right there. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I'll be, I'll be signing the cheque very <laughs> shortly, I promise you that. Um, what we do, I mean, we're very close to the end. If, if there was a passing word that you wanted to say, a single sentence, what would be that sentence, do you think? Because I, I can ask you to do a little 
really the pitch for, for Phoenix to a certain extent. But but if there was that one piece of advice, you're down the pub, you're with your mates, they run, they run a business, what, what would be that one piece of advice, the key thing that will frighten the daylights out of them? I, I don't think I'd frighten the daylights out of them. I'd actually say the reverse. I'd say it's not as scary as you think. If you, if you could, and, and, and your colleagues of any size of organisation, spend half a day together just thinking through what's important to your firm. Just take that time out. What's important to your firm? Most people would get 80 to 90% of what they need in a disaster done in that in that time. There might be the 10 or 20% that need you to squirrel off and talk to suppliers or look at contracts, um, but you'd rather have 80% than nothing. And at the, at the moment, right now, too many firms have nothing and are hoping that they're the one that it hasn't happened to and therefore they're ignoring it until of course it does. So zero to 80% really quick and then the extra 20% it can be a huge business benefit if you just spend a bit of time in, 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 in conquering the whole, uh, the whole lot. A little bit of time that's all you've got to do consider what your business is up to what's important in your business and make certain that you are protected it's your business at the end of the day and you've got to make absolutely certain that you're going to be there not just tomorrow but the day after and the day after that regardless of what comes along be it a cyber attack be it flooding be it whatever it is the change in the market you've got to do that for planning you've done it already with your business plan and you don't read that anymore do you of course you don't. Take your business plan out. Make certain that's up to date as well because that could actually help in this particular situation. If you're watching this on YouTube, please do subscribe to the channel. You can do that right now if you're watching this regardless of where it is. Actually, because on the video just there, there's a little subscribe button. If you just press on that, uh, you'll be able to subscribe uh, to our particular channel. Please do go to our website as well. That's www.businessconnectionslive.com. Uh, we've got a fantastic free booklet there. In fact, I'm just going to show this to you. Where, where is it? Here? Oh, no, it's, that's me. Um, I, I'm there. There we go. If you go, you'll see just there. We've got this fantastic booklet. If you want to get more out of your YouTube videos, uh, then that's a free booklet you can download. All we want is to know your name and also your email and we'll send it to you. It's as easy and as straightforward as that. Coming up on future programs next week, we've got this gentleman. He's going to be joining us. Uh, this is uh, Mark Hughes. He's from Funky Social Media. And he's going to be talking about Facebook. LinkedIn has proved to be very, very popular. Uh, Mark is going to be telling us what you should and what you shouldn't be doing and how you can make Facebook a more effective way to market your business. And don't forget, Brad Burton, who you probably heard on Radio 2 a few weeks back, uh, he's going to be with us on the 2nd of April. I always ask our guests, we're going to slightly overrun. I do apologise about I'm sorry, team, I knew it would happen. Uh, but I'm going to ask you, it, it really is key benefits about, about uh, Phoenix what you can offer to, uh, to businesses. If you can start with your name, rank and serial number and straight down number three, I would imagine would be the best place. If you could do it straight down there, it'd be fantastic. So in your own time, this is your audition, take one. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike Osborne, Managing Director of Phoenix's Business Continuity uh, Division. Uh, Phoenix is a specialist business continuity. We're 25 year old uh, this year in terms of delivering disaster recovery and business continuity. We're UK wide and we're, we're nice people who know what we're talking about. Uh, we've talked about a lot on this session. Uh, we've created a, a website for SMEs, which is www.phoenix.co.uk forward slash SME. And on there you'll find uh, a lot of the reference material that I've referred to, a lot of general advice uh, uh, and white papers, uh, and it's all there uh, to, to review in your own time. So there we go, it's as simple as that. And if you want to have a quick look at that website now, we can, there it is. And you can see all the resources just down the side here. Uh, fascinating website. It'll give you a bit more of an insight into it. And as, and as was said there, the web address is www.phoenix.co.uk uh, forward slash SME. And there you go. And that wraps up tonight's promo. I hope you've actually enjoyed it. So Brad's going to be with us on the second. Mark Hughes is going to be next week. We're going to be talking about Facebook. Uh, if you are watching, and as I said on YouTube, please do subscribe. Don't forget, you can watch all the programs, including the big aviation debate at www.businessconnectionslive.com. And I hope you've enjoyed the program. If you have been thinking to yourself, do you know, I really do need to do something about this. My IT, am I backing it up properly? And what would happen if I was to lose all that? My 
finances, my accounts, my customer list, everything like that. If that's the situation that you find yourself in this evening, then start thinking about it seriously and maybe have a word with Mike Osborne, Managing Director, Phoenix Business Continuity Unit, Acknowledge Leaders, the award-winning provider of business continuity and disaster recovery services. Listen, from all the team here, Mike, can I thank you very much indeed for coming Pleasure. in. I've enjoyed it's it. It's been fabulous. And from me, Steve Highland, and the rest of the team, we'll be back again next week at 6 o'clock. See you then. Bye for now. Bye-bye.